Hello, beautiful people. We are here in my book playlist where we are going through the book titled Self-Development, a handbook for the ambitious by H. Addington Bruce. I want to take a minute real quick and say thank you for all of you that have joined this channel, who have supported me, who have shared this content to help others along the way. Because you know what? Self-development is key. And coming from someone who has lived quite some time, 60 is something to brag about, and has had many careers, have been a parent, have been in a relationship for over 31 years, and have had some major setbacks because life is perfect in its imperfect way. And I understand that even here where I'm at, there's still so much more room for me to develop. And if you are young and starting your journey on life and you found this book, I hope that you can overlook any arcane language and filter through the things that do resonate. Sometimes tough love is the best love and there is a lot of tough love in this book. Okay, if you're ready, let's jump on to the next chapter, which is titled Making Oneself Interested. Mm, I'm excited to see what's in here. All right, let's get started. At the very outset of any discussion regarding ways and means of increasing one's interest in one's work, the objection may be raised that conceivably there are circumstances under which it is harmful rather than helpful to attempt to increase vocational interest. Suppose, for example, that a man is doing work for which he is not really adapted by nature. Should he not be urged to find work for which he is better fitted rather than to cultivate interest in the work he now is doing? Undoubtedly, a man should do his best through self-study to choose a vocation according with any outstanding natural aptitudes he may possess. And undoubtedly, if he is a man of outstanding natural aptitudes and has already chosen badly, he should shift into another vocation, provided he can be sure of choosing more wisely when he determines to change. Undoubtedly, too, parents should make it a rule to study their children carefully with a view to discovering outstanding natural aptitudes and assisting their children in a wide choice of vocations. But how many children exhibit outstanding natural aptitudes? The more I study this problem of aptitude and vocation, the stronger becomes my conviction that, for the generality of people, success depends not so much on close agreement between vocation and natural aptitude as on the gaining of acquired aptitude through sound working methods and the cultivating of a keen interest in the vocation chosen. Of course, where there is marked disagreement between the special requirements of a vocation and the mental or physical peculiarities of the individual in that vocation, real success is impossible by any means. And the world unquestionably contains numerous people unsuccessful because of this. But also it contains numerous people highly successful despite no careful guidance in vocation choosing and no training with one particular vocation in view. Can it be convincingly alleged that the successful were successful simply because they chanced to stumble into vocations precisely suited to their natural aptitudes? And if it be argued that natural aptitude unconsciously influenced them in their choice of vocation, how does it come that natural aptitude did not similarly influence the failures to save them from being failures? No. Granting that natural aptitude often plays a determining role, the fact seems to be that for most men and women, success depends mainly on something else. That something else, acquired aptitude, is the resultant of several cooperating agencies, chief among which is putting one's soul into one's work. When this chief agency is absent, success is certain to elude the seeker, no matter how richly he may be endowed in natural aptitude for this chosen vocation. Let us not deceive ourselves. Some people, but only some, may justly plead 
vocational maladjustment as an excuse for failure. Most people who fail do so because they have not trained themselves to achieve and are much more interested in other things, in assuming themselves, for example, than they are in their work. Which implies, of course, that they have no clear notion either of their responsibility as workers or of the importance of the work they are doing. A positive contempt for their work may actually be at the bottom of their lack of interest in it. When this is the case, a prerequisite to increasing interest is the gaining of a saner attitude, a shifting of the point of view so as to obtain something of the spirit which prompted Robert Louis Stevenson's wonderful prayer. Quote, the day returns and brings us the petty round of irritating concerns and duties. Help us to play the man. Help us to perform them with laughter and kind faces. Let the cheerfulness abound with industry. Give us to go blithely on our business all this day. Bring us to our resting beds, weary and content and undishonored, and grant us, in the end, the gift of sleep. Amen. End quote. This, manifestly, was the prayer of an idealist, and every worker must be an idealist if his work is to be something more to him than a disagreeable necessity. In particular, he must idealize his work itself. Ponder this statement by Dr. S. S. Curry of Boston, one of the hardest workers I have ever known, and a worker who has gained about as much insight into the true philosophy of work as any man of my acquaintance. Quote, Anything can be made drudgery. A man can study art or sing, paint pictures, edit newspapers, or write books, and make his work drudgery. Drudgery is working perfunctorily. It is work without aspiration, work without an ideal. No man can do anything well in life without an ideal. If a man undertakes a certain work, he must begin it by awakening and realizing the importance of that work in the world's life. He must form a definite ideal of the best possible way of doing that work and of its relation to the world. In short, no man can accomplish anything in a negative, indifferent attitude toward his work. End quote. Also bear in mind, if you please, James Freeman Clark's definition of drudgery as, quote, work without imagination, end quote. If you are one of those to whom the chosen work is hateful, bring your imagination to bear upon it. Try to think of it in the way Dr. Curry suggests. Try to picture what your work means, not in monetary or other terms to yourself, but in terms of benefit to your fellow man. In proportion, as you make yourself feel, I am really of use in the world. In proportion, as you develop, as your motive for the hope and desire and belief of rendering helpful service, interest in your work will grow. And this, moreover, is the one sure anti-drudgery specific. It works unfailingly, as all who have made trial of it will gladly testify. As a further aid to increasing interest in your work, compel yourself to pay more attention to it than you have been doing. It is quite true that the more you become interested in it, the easier it will be to pay attention to it. But if interest breeds attention, so is it true that attention breeds interest. Apply this to your own case. You are, we will assume, a traveling salesman anxious to make a good record, to increase your sales from year to year, and to develop ideas that will steadily raise your earning power. Long ago, a friend suggested to you that you might find the study of psychology really helpful to you in a business way. You rejected the suggestion. Psychology, you are sure, was an abstruse science of no practical use to anyone. Also, you were sure it would be beyond your understanding, for you had never been to college. And anyway, 
you were not in the least interested in psychology and did not believe you could ever become interested in it. But what are the facts? Psychology is, in one sense, an abstruse science, yet it is of practical use in every vocation. One does not have to go to college in order to obtain a working knowledge of its principles. And if a man will only make a real effort to study psychology attentively, he will ere long find himself becoming more and more interested in it. Here is an experiment I commend to you. The next time you start on the road, put in your grip a couple of psychological handbooks. Charles C. Peters' Human Conduct and Boris Sidis Psychology of Suggestion will be excellent for your purpose. They will take up no more space than a mystery novel or a fiction magazine, and will far more repay you for reading them. And you will have plenty of leisure to read them on trains and in the evenings. Devote some time to them every day, if only half an hour. Occasionally put in an entire evening at these books instead of lounging aimlessly in the hotel lobby or killing time at a musical comedy. At first, you may find this pretty dull, or fully as dull as you expected to find it, but persist. Presently, your attitude will begin to change. The science which you thought abstruse and incomprehensible will present itself to you in a more favorable light. You will be pleased to discover that certain ideas you have formed regarding human nature, gained from personal observation and applied in your business life, are confirmed by the handbooks. Also, you will discover, not without pleasure, that the handbooks are helping you to greater insight into human nature than you possessed before, which is most desirable from a business point of view. And thereafter, if you are really in earnest about wanting to succeed, psychology will interest you as you never dreamed it would. You will even begin to visit public libraries to make acquaintances with special works in business psychology. All this, observe, will come as the result of determinedly paying attention to psychology. A similar result may be expected from attention insistently directed to the study of any other useful subject. Adopt the same principle with regard to your work itself. Force yourself really to attend to it to study it as you have not done before. Buy books that will give you sound information regarding it. Read them attentively. Also subscribe to and read attentively some journal devoted exclusively to the interests of your trade or profession. All truly alert businessmen read trade journals as a matter of real necessity. They feel that it is impossible for them to continue progressing unless they keep abreast of the latest developments in their particular line of business, as recorded in the journals devoted to that business. Well, there are trade journals specially addressed to you, whatever your vocation. If you are an electrician, you will find a number of good journals bearing directly on the work you are doing. Journals published in your interest, published for the express purpose of helping you to become skillful at your trade. Do you at present read any of these journals? Do you even know their names? If you are a plumber, there are other journals of particular value to you as a plumber. Likewise, if you're a hotel clerk, a bank clerk, a hardware dealer, a cigar maker, or whatever else you may be. For every vocation, there are trade journals. Some of them, of course, much better than others. He is indeed a wise young man who early becomes a subscriber and constant reader of a good journal dealing with his trade. He will learn from it how other men in the trade have won success. Almost every week, he will glean from it something of direct helpfulness in winning success himself. One week, he will be specially enlightened by a leading editorial. Another, he will profit most of all from a seemingly insignificant item of three or four lines, of peculiar interest to him because it chances to touch on a problem which he is, for the moment, much concerned. Or, tucked away in some letter in the trade journal's correspondence columns, he may come across an idea opening up to him new vistas of thought, perhaps a new avenue of opportunity. 
and all the while his reading of the journal devoted to his work will help him develop keener interest in that work. Besides reading trade journals, attend trade conventions whenever you get the chance. The convention habit, in fact, is valuable for other reasons than the aid it renders in increasing a worker's interest in his work. Though, unfortunately, this is not always appreciated as it should be. As I was reminded when, shortly before the annual convention of a learned society, I chanced to ask one of its members, Are you going to the Washington meeting? No, was his almost explosive answer. It would only be a waste of time. I never go to conventions. Why should I? There's nothing in a convention except a few addresses and papers, and I can read these at my leisure after they get into print. Many men, not sovereigns only, but men in all walks of professional and business life, feel similarly regarding the conventions of the organized bodies to which they belong. Even if they do not have to journey outside their home city, they keep away from conventions. They look with wonder, even with amused contempt, at men who have the convention habit so strongly that year after year they travel long distances to attend annual gatherings. Yet actually the men with the convention habit are the wiser men. To an extent, the stay-at-homes do not appreciate they profit from going to conventions. They return better fitted to carry on in their respective vocations. They gain in knowledge, keenness of mind, and breadth of vision. Nor do they thus benefit simply through hearing worthwhile papers read. This is perhaps the least of all the advantages offered by conventions. Far more important is the opportunity conventions provide for personal contacts outside the assembly hall for free, informal interchange of ideas between men of similar interests, yet of widely different individual experiences. Chatting in hotel corridors or just outside the convention door, 10 minutes may suffice to draw from an enlightened veteran information clearing the way to a solution of some naughty personal problem. Ambition is stirred anew, inspiration found, fresh resolves formed under the stimulus of these invigorating convention chats. There is the opportunity, too, to study the personality of leaders in one's profession or business, to gain unexpected glimpses of the qualities that have made them leaders, and thus unconsciously to aid in shaping oneself for leadership. A gesture a few casual words by an uncommonly successful man may be of revelatory import in helping to overcome some defect that has been acting as an unsuspected drag on progress. Important indeed are the lessons which may in this way be learned by the observing. Again, the social spirit, invaluable in success winning, is kept alive and quickened by the convention atmosphere. Tendencies to aloofness, exclusiveness, perhaps outright snobbery, are checked. There is increased ease and delight in intercourse with one's fellows. Which reminds me that, to the man eager to develop greater interest in his work, there are few things more important than contact in the everyday, workday life with men themselves much interested in it. This, if only because of the subtle influence of psychic contagion, one of the strongest formative and deformative factors in the shaping of men. Its power lies in the fact that it has its origin in the tendency of human beings to imitate one another. Thus, a man's associates, especially if he is much with them, become working models for him, so to speak. Are the men with whom you most frequently associate good working models for you or poor ones in point of being interested in the work they're doing? If they are not, associate with them less frequently. Cultivate contact with keener or, at all events, more eager minds. Especially be sure to do this if perchance you have drifted into an intimacy with shiftless or comparatively shiftless fellow workers. Their influence will not merely make it hard for you to become really interested in your work, but will work injury to your character itself. It is this potent, character-shaping influence of psychic contagion that gives point to the familiar saying, 
Tell me who a man's friends are, and I will tell you what he is. I do not know who your friends are, but you do. You know perfectly well whether they are energetic or lazy men. You know whether they are strong-willed or spineless. You know whether they are competent or incompetent. You know, in fine, whether they are good models or the reverse. If the reverse, the sooner you select better models, the sooner your prospects will change for the better. You are reluctant, it may be, to acknowledge the weakness of your present intimates. You would find excuses for them because they are your friends. That does credit to your spirit of loyalty, but it does not alter the facts one whit. And the supreme fact, so far as you're concerned, is that the longer you associate with them, the more you will become like them, and the slower your progress will be. Of course, you are disinclined to break with them, nor need you wrench your own feelings and hurt theirs by an outright break. But obviously, you can keep company with them less frequently. And whether inside your working place or outside of it, you can surely find comrades whose influence will be in the direction of turning your mind more ardently toward your work, not away from it. This subject of psychic contagion is so important to you, for reasons quite apart from the developing of vocational interests, that we must come back to it again. Meantime, assuming that you are resolved to spare no effort to make yourself more interested in your daily duties and problems, let us turn to the related question of how your growing interests may most surely be accompanied by efficient thinking. For the chances are that if you have not hitherto learned how to throw yourself into your work with enthusiasm, you equally need to learn how to do truly efficient thinking. Though you should not feel unduly mortified because of this, most people go through life without doing much thinking really worthy of the name. End of chapter. Wow, this is good stuff. I'm sitting here processing this and looking forward to sharing my thoughts on this at the next video. Please do, if you haven't done so, hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, share this with your friends, and do leave me a comment.